Welcome to another episode of Pinky Up, where we explore the wide world of luxury culinary products and ingredients. The goal of Pinky Up is to learn and teach about high-end products to ultimately give you a better understanding of what they are and how to work with them. Today we are going in on a very old, very famous, very controversial delicacy known as foie gras. All right, before we begin, let's start by defining what foie gras is. Foie gras is the fatty liver of a duck or a goose. Foie gras is a French word literally translating to fatty liver. Foie gras is fatty, it's rich, it's unctuous, and it can be quite, quite pricey. To put it simply, I would personally describe foie gras as, uh, as pretty much duck butter. Like, really, really good duck butter. And sure, foie gras is a French name, it's a French food, people think of it as a French delicacy. However, the history of the stuff runs a little deeper. Long before King Louis slammed plates of foie gras in Versailles, it was enjoyed amongst the pharaohs of ancient Egypt. 5,000 some odd years ago, ancient Egyptian farmers took notice of a physiological seasonal change that happened amongst waterfowl in the area. Waterfowl, like ducks and geese, go through a seasonal behavioral change called gorging, which means that they eat more than they naturally would to pack on fat to store energy for a long migration. And you guessed it, a lot of that fat is actually naturally stored in the livers of these waterfowl. Right. Right in the liver. This is why I'm a cook and not a doctor. When ancient Egyptian farmers took notice of this, they began force feeding the waterfowl, basically plumping them up for better yields. You know, fattier liver, larger meat, larger breasts, that sort of thing. Who doesn't like a larger breast? I mean, there are literally even ancient Egyptian hieroglyphic drawings of farmers force feeding geese, so it's pretty wild. The ancient Romans too enjoyed their fair share of fatty duck liver, but the Roman farmers fed their animals a diet of berries and dates leading to a richer, sweeter foie gras. Then a little later come the Middle Ages, and like many other forms of culture, foie gras was sort of erased from historical record. Then at some point between the Middle Ages and the 17th century, due to religious restrictions from eating pork, European Jews raised ducks for sustenance, and as a result would produce what what would later be called foie gras. So it wasn't quite fully lost, thanks to the Jews. It wasn't until the 17th century when a French chef named Jean-Pierre Claus, I really hope that I pronounced that name right, created a special dish for the King of France. The dish was such a hit that it revived the presence of foie gras and sort of brought it back into the European mainstream. Though foie gras has been enjoyed all over the planet for a very long time, it wasn't produced here in the United States until fairly recently. Basically, the US government banned the import of raw poultry sometime in the 1980s, and it was at that moment that US producers started to open up shop. However, since the jump due to controversy brought on by animal rights groups, foie gras producers have never had it easy here in the United States. It would be impossible to make a video about foie gras and not talk about the social dilemmas that come from producing this stuff, right? Specifically here in the United States. Gavage, a French word for hand feeding, is the practice of inserting a feed tube down the animal's esophagus, where feed is then funneled through that tube directly into the animal's crop. Those against foie gras argue that the process of gavage and the overfeeding of the animals is cruel treatment. They argue that the process of feeding is painful to the animal and that the overfeeding of the animal makes it sickly and sort of uncomfortable in the remaining, you know, two weeks of its life before it's killed and processed. Those for foie gras argue that the production of the product is no different than any other animal that's raised for food. They say that the physical makeup of the waterfowl will make it so that the feeding process is not painful. And that American foie gras producers operate some of the most sustainable and responsible facilities in the country. There have literally been like dozens of full-blown documentaries made all about the, the ethics, the morals, the production of foie gras. If we really maxed out on the topic, this video would be three hours long. So to help break it down nice and easy for my small brain, I was lucky enough to get in contact with one of the few few existing American foie gras producers to ask a few questions. The whole issue with foie gras be lives and dies by whether the process of putting a tube, whether it's a plastic tube or a metal tube, into a duck's crop is painful or not painful. Now, as a human, we would not want that done to us. And the reason is, is that we, we have an esophagus that's a reflex esophagus. We have teeth, we chew our food, we swallow it, and we digest in our stomach. Ducks do not have teeth. They're what's called a calcified esophagus. The food is, 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 goes down into the crop and then gets digested. When they eat, they pick off the ground and they'll pick pebbles and corn and, and feed and, and things that are edible and things that are not, they will go into the crop, what gets digested, gets digested, what doesn't get, gets passed through. When a mother duck feeds its baby, she will actually take her beak, pick up the food, a worm, uh, and, 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 and literally 
gavage the baby duck by placing its beak down into the duck's esophagus and dropping the food. So the process that we do is basically a natural same process. Um, uh, also ducks, so, so the calcified esophagus enables that way of feeding. Now, that doesn't take away the fact that the imagery is, is different than the reality. In a sense that you have to ask yourself, okay, that is the process. Now, does it cause harm? Does it cause disease? Does it, and time and time again, the proof has been, no, it does not. The USDA approves the process. Veterinarians approve the process. Um, of course, there's been countries that banned it, and that's because the animal rights activists were, generally those were countries where forgot was not produced in to begin with for the most part. And the general, the, the, the animal activists politically were stronger than their opposition, and they were able to pass these, these things as do sometimes despite reality. Um, and But it's a struggle that we go through all the time. We're facing a, a battle in New York City where New York City wants to ban foie gras. They haven't even visited the farm. They haven't seen I heard the farm. About that. They haven't seen the process. And it's, but it's very political. There's and animal rights activists are very strong. And sometimes a politician will say, well, there's so many people who want it and so many who don't. And I'm going to go with what's going to get me more votes, uh, despite of the reality. Mm -hmm. So my, at the end of the day, my feeling is that everybody should understand the process learn about it and make their own decision whether this is something that they want to have, eat or not. You asked me about the cycle. So basically, yeah. we we breed these these particular ducks. It's a male Muscovy and a female Pekin. The, okay. uh, when you breed those two breeds, the offshoot would be a moulard, M-O-U-L-A-R-D, which comes from the French word for mule, because it's a mule duck that doesn't reproduce. So we produce these ducks literally for frog production. Uh, they're flightless ducks. The Muscovy is a wild breed. The Pekin is a domesticated breed. We um, we then place those baby chicks in in nursery in a nursery for four weeks, where it's a completely open barn. There's no fences. There's no cages. There's no and they roam around on on wood shavings. They eat. They drink. After that four week period, they move to another barn for eight weeks. Uh, uh, and again, completely open barns. No pens. No cages. And they roam around and they eat and they go outdoors and indoors. And at that point, they're 12 weeks old. Um, just to give you an idea, your average chicken that you would buy in a supermarket, your average duck is somewhere in the neighborhood of eight, nine weeks old. People sometimes think that chickens or ducks are a year old by the time you actually eat them. And they're not. Your average three and a half pound chicken is about eight weeks old. Your average five pound duck is about nine weeks old. Oh. So these are actually older than your average Pekin duck produced by maple leaf or others. Um, so now the duck is 12 weeks old. Now it gets placed into a pen. So so they've been free roaming for the first 12 weeks. Now, now this is the, the most confined they're ever going to be, which is in a pen where every pen holds 10 ducks in plenty of room, which is governed by the, the governmental standards. Um, and they are placed in that pen for 10 days, and they'll be fed twice a day for 21 days. That's the entire process of gavage or hand feeding. Okay. So they'll be placed in those pens, they'll be fed for 21 days, twice a day, um, and each feeding is about three or four seconds. So the entire process is 21 days, twice a day, three, four seconds per feed. Some imaginary thought that they're hooked to some kind of a auger and are fed all day long that's not the case it's three they're fed by very capable feeders who actually gauge the quantity of feed that the duck can handle and so on and that's a 21 day process so at that point they're going to be about 15 weeks old and at that point they'll move to the processing plant and uh that would be the end of a pretty nice journey Michael Lenny and I had an excellent conversation all about foie from culinary techniques to farming ethics. So if you want to take a deeper dive and learn a little more on the topic, I will post that full interview uh, somewhere on the channel. All right, so why does foie gras cost you so much cheddar? The fact is, ducks and geese raised for foie gras take two and a half times longer to raise than the average chicken, which means that it takes more resources, human labor, and care to raise each animal. 
Plus, you know, due to regulation, social issues, and other speed bumps, running a foie gras farm in the US is just, it's no easy task. Plus, you know, there are only a few foie gras producers in existence in the United States. And you don't need a business minor in economics to understand supply and demand, right? People want it, not many people make it, the price goes up. Between the scarcity of producers and just the human labor and the raw resource input that goes into raising each animal, you can start to see why foie gras might cost you. All right, so we've explored the wide world of foie gras theory. Now let's talk about the fun part, the part why you might still be watching, how to cook and eat the stuff. All right, so there are a bunch of different ways you can prepare foie gras. It's best to think of them in terms of low heat preparations and high heat preparations. High heat prep, meaning anything over 350 degrees Fahrenheit, according to Chef Michael. High heat preparation might include, you know, stirring and grilling, scoring and searing, that sort of thing. Low heat preparations include traditional torchons, terrines, mousses. Now, you can buy the foie portioned out, and to most home cooks, it's probably not the worst idea. But if you buy a whole liver, it's probably gonna be a little more cost effective, you know, if you're feeding a party or something. However, it is a good look to learn how to work with the whole raw product. So to do so, I've called on a buddy of mine to help us clean our foie up. Look at this handsome boy. This is mi amigo Zach. He's worked at a handful of fine dining spots around the country and was in charge of cleaning foie at the restaurant that he worked at prior to COVID. Before even thinking about cleaning the foie, it's important that it be brought to room temperature. Zach compares it to butter, right? The foie can crack and crumble on you if it's chilled, so don't skip that step. A foie gras consists of two lobes, one small and one large. Just gently detach the lobes, then set one aside. Use your thumbs to break into the liver in a spreading motion. The goal is to feel for veins, then remove them. Some veins are long, others short, and some are part of larger tree-shaped networks, so do your best to follow the vein up until it stops. Sometimes there's greenish-yellow discoloring in lower-grade foie, just go ahead and lightly scrape that away with a knife. At first, working with the stuff can be spooky, but just get in there and have some confidence, foie is actually pretty forgiving. To spread the board, I'm going to show you two ways to prepare foie gras. One being a simple, approachable method that you can easily try at home. The other, a little more involved, a little more creative. But don't worry, both are delicious in their very own ways. Let's start simple with seared foie gras. Here I have a whole lobe that I'm slicing into three quarters of an inch portions. If you're working with pre-portioned foie, then you won't have to do this step. When slicing foie for searing, it's important not to cut the pieces too thin or you'll lose a lot of fat. Also, don't worry about the veins or blood spots. All that stuff is going to disappear when we sear. Scoring is optional and strictly for visual, not technical effect, but I think it looks nice. Season the foie liberally, then place it in a preheated pan over high heat. The foie only needs 30 to 40 seconds on each side. When it has nice color, flip it over and finish it on the other side. Do not overcook the foie or you'll lose all your gras, as Michael says. Also, don't cook it for too long and be sure not to scorch it on too high of a heat. I'm making a simple port mustard pan sauce with dry port wine, grainy mustard, and demi-glaze, a reduced veal stock. Deglaze with the wine and cook down until almost dry. Add the demi-glaze and cook for another minute or two, then finish with mustard, swirl in cold butter, and hit it with a squeeze of lemon juice. The viscosity from the reduced wine along with the collagen-rich demi emulsified with the cold butter will award you with a gorgeous, rich, sauce for the foie. The thing is, foie is basically all fat, which means it's already quite rich without the sauce. So to balance the dish, it's important to incorporate some form of tartness, sweetness, or better yet, both. To hit those notes and cut the richness, I'm sneaking in a few dollops of blueberry compote. And that is that. Serve this with something nice and crunchy like this her toasted bread and let your animal instincts kick in. Show me the money. This next technique is more for entertainment purposes than a technical how-to, but I think you're gonna find it interesting. Pink curing salt. You really only wanna use like, ah. 0.25? Just off the top Just of the Just off the <laughs> Zach is going to make a torsion of foie gras. <laughs> which means that he's seasoning a whole cleaned liver with a bit of sugar, salt, curing salt, and brandy. Making torsion, and really all low heat preparations for foie gras, are a lot more involved than high heat cooking methods. Doing this is a process, a, a fun one, but it does take a while. Zach is using plastic wrap to wind the foie up into a tight cylinder here. It looks simple enough, and with practice it is, but it can be tricky at first. He makes it look easy. All we have to do now is poach the torsion for 90 seconds in simmering water, then chill it down in an ice bath to stop the cooking. Nice form. Yeah, thank you. The footwork is really what's most impressive. <laughs> <laughs>
Wrapping torchon in plastic wrap alone can be messy because the fat hardens on the outside, which is easily removed with the ring mold, but you can avoid it altogether by first wrapping the torchon in cheesecloth to absorb the fat. For the sake of the vid, we made a torchon ahead of time and popped it in the freezer because you'll, you'll see in a second. That purple fruit window is actually blueberry leather that Zach made before coming into the kitchen. The idea here is to heat it up so that it's malleable, then for the first minute out of the oven, you can shape it into whatever shape you want before it hardens. You just kind of got to work fast. That diglet looking thing is the frozen torsion I was telling you about. Hold her up. <laughs> Waffle panna cotta. Zach made that by steeping waffles in cream. Now this is a crumble of puffed long grain rice and a number of nuts and seeds. And this dark syrupy stuff is a peppercorn gastrique, which is essentially a sweet and sour sauce, but in this case it's a sweet and sour and spicy sauce, like a peppery spicy, not a stinging spicy. It was delicious. If you were wondering why we froze the last torchon, this is the answer. Frozen torchon of foie gras allows us to grate it like cheese. You know, just imagine grating frozen butter on a cheese grater. That's pretty much what's going on here. Foie and waffles. <laughs> <laughs> foie waffles. Cheers. <laughs> All right, so by now, maybe you're excited about foie gras, you wanna cook it, you wanna play with it, so how do you get your hands on some? So you can totally buy foie gras pre-portioned out, and if you don't need a lot, it's not a bad move. However, if you buy a whole liver, it could be a better value, and remember, foie gras stores very well in the freezer. Think of it like any other high-fat product, right? Wrap it tightly in plastic wrap, and maybe some aluminum foil, pop it in a bag, squeeze the air out, put it in the freezer, it'll last for a while. Or better yet, if you have a vac sealer, go ahead and vacuum seal that off, date label it, pop it in the freezer, that'll stay fresh for a pretty long time. So in terms of foie gras grades, it comes in A, B, and C grade. The grading scale just refers to the size, the shape, the color, the texture of the foie gras. So if the liver is plump, it's evenly colored, it has a nice texture, that's usually given a A grade. If it has some visible blood spots or other imperfections, it might be given a B or a C. It's not that the B or a C grade is that much worse than the A grade, it's that you want to use them for different preparations if you can. A grade is usually reserved for low heat preparations, where veins and blood spots are especially unwanted. B and C grades are mostly used for high heat preparations because the intensity of the heat does away with sort of any veins or blood spots that you might see. Also, you can use B or C grade for if you're making a mousse because you're just gonna destroy the liver anyways after you clean it up, so. All right, so we just went over a lot. You know what you need to know. Uh, so where do you get your hands on some of this stuff, right? Where can you source foie gras? If you're in the US and you're looking for foie gras, you're not gonna find any better than Hudson Valley Farm. They're super passionate about what they do. Michael and Lenny were great guys. Their facilities are they're green, they're sustainable, they're responsible about what they do, and it really shows in the product. So I will leave their website link in the description below if you want to check them out. Right on! Whether you are friend or foe of the foie, I hope this video gave you the points that you need to confidently work with it, confidently talk about the topic of foie gras as a whole, and just kind of have a better understanding of what foie is. Also, I want to give a colossal thank you to Chef Michael and Lenny of Hudson Valley Foie Gras for taking time out of their busy week to come to our little corner of the internet and teach us a little bit more about foie gras, let me pick their brains. The full interview for that is actually going to be posted on my channel, so I'll link it. I probably already linked it, but I'm going to link it again so you can check that out if you're interested. Also, Zach, you're the man. Thanks for teaching us how to clean the foie and your cool creative way on how to use it. If you dug this video, be sure to subscribe to the channel if you're new here. If you're an existing omnivore, thank you for watching until the end. Uh, I do a lot more short and medium form stuff on TikTok, Instagram, post to Facebook sometimes, so check me out there if you want to. And I shall see you beautiful foie fiends next week. Au revoir.